tonight and for tomorrow. Uh, we have Daryl Sink with us from uh, Monterey, California. He's been, uh, I'm just going to read this so I don't miss anything. Uh, he's got 29 years of experience designing learning experiences. Uh, he's the author of six guides to instructional design uh, and has won the, uh, or is the recipient of the ISPI Professional Service Award. Uh, he, he's gonna, tonight he's going to present the practice of instructional systems design as it exists in the real world today. Uh, he's going to share how it's being modified uh, and how it's being used to produce uh, training solutions that are better, faster, and easier. Um, and I think I got those in the right order. So uh, with no further ado, Daryl Sink. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> well. Thank you so much. Uh, what a pleasure to be here and see the growth of this organization. Um, and much to the, uh, uh, the founders of it. I know Guy Wallace was involved and Dick and Mark and I, who else was involved in the founding of it? Lots of people. Okay. 20. 20 people. Wonderful. Well, you seem to be doing everything right, that's for sure. Um, the, the wonderful uh, meeting places, the the uh, number of members you've gotten together in just one short year. So congratulations to all of you. And it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to help uh, hopefully contribute to, uh, to the program. Um, interesting topic, this little topic up here, ISD, Faster, Better, Easier. Um, I really um, have been working with the concept for a long, long time. Um, after all, we do custom design and development. And I do it with uh, a group of associates. We have about 10 very senior associates. And I'm always looking for a better way to do it, a faster way. And since I do some of it myself, <laughs> I realize how taxing the work is. It's quite taxing. If you, if you, anybody hasn't done it, <laughs> it's taxing. It, it's uh, it's time-consuming. It's thought-provoking. It's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And uh, so I'm always looking for something that can make it a little bit easier, too. Okay? Now somebody says, uh, I know Tiago likes to say cheaper. <laughs> and I say, Tiago! <laughs> but the, the point is, if it's better, faster, and easier, it, it may just be cheaper, too. And uh, but, but, but these three are, are very important to me. Now, where I got started, though, in formalizing this a bit was in 2002. Um, uh, we had an article that came out in Training Magazine a year or so before that, which was kind of damning the <laughs> ISD uh, process and model. And so ISPI asked several of us to respond to that, and so there was one whole issue of performance and instruction. And um, uh, I had an article in there, Ruth Clark had an article in there, several other people. And um, um, so when I started to look at that uh, and to write the article, um, you know, I'm going like, why is everybody so negative about this? And so I just tried to approach it from a positive thing. What are we doing with ISD? What, ha what has changed a bit about it? But let's don't throw the baby out with bathwater, okay? I feel very strongly about that. When somebody says ISD, ISD is obsolete, then I turn around and say, well, let's see. Is not knowing anything about your audience obsolete? Audience analysis. Is not, not knowing anything about the context in which you're going to be working obsolete? Is not knowing what the business need is for the training program obsolete? If you don't know what you're going to teach, is that obsolete? If you don't know what direction you want the learners to go in, is that obsolete? If you're not going to measure whether they got there or not, is that obsolete? If you're not going to design great learning experiences that not only get to the head but the heart too, is that obsolete? And I couldn't figure out what they're talking about. It doesn't seem to me that. Any, I mean, if you're, if you're just making a presentation, you need to think about who you're going to present to, right? What the, what the objective is, you know, how you're going to tell whether you did any good or not, how you're going to engage the audience, all those kinds of things. So, I don't really think it's obsolete. We may need to tweak this and that, and we've learned to work with it very quickly. If you uh, talk to, as I have, 
uh, in the last few years, I've interviewed a lot of master designers. People are just fabulous at this, they're quick, they're, they're great at it. And uh, what's different between the master and the novice? And a lot of it is they see the whole picture at once. So it's easy sometimes, I think, for some of those people to think, oh, I'm really not using it, but when I pin them down, are you thinking about the audience? Are you thinking about this? Are you thinking about, oh yeah, of course. I just, it's, it works fast for me. <laughs> now that I'm, you know, masterful at it, but they don't say, say that, but I'll say it for them. Now that they're masterful at it, they're fast at it. And so um, I approached the article from that standpoint, and this is a little more on the, uh, on the topic. I've also been asked over time, in particular by IBM, to generate these kinds of things. What, what uh, I generated uh, a, a whole ton of job aids for them, is what I really did, on the procedures of doing various aspects of instruction design development. So some of it came out of that too. And uh, um, uh, so, um, what is the concept faster, easier, uh, better about, it doesn't matter what order you say them in, I don't believe. <laughs> um, so, what we're going to do is take a look at that concept tonight. Um, we're going to, I'm going to give you a couple examples, but I'm also going to pull from you folks some examples. We're going to work together a little bit, probably in threes or fours, and see if you, you know, all of you have a ton of experience yourself. And once I uh, make sure that we all understand the same idea about it, uh, what the concept is, and that we're not one of the big things when we get into the activities. I don't want to throw out best practices and what the research says. In other words, we can't shorten something by just saying, well, we're just not going to do it. You know? <laughs> I'm after those things that still maintain the integrity of the models for instructional systems design, but it's better, and it's faster, and it's easier to do. So, uh, we'll be looking for ideas that do still maintain the integrity uh, of the process and so forth. Okay? So, let's take a look at that. We're going to take a look at some tips and best practices in ISD. What uh, do we modify uh, about the ISD model? What has been modified in particular around e-learning? You know, what's going on there? Um, what master developers know? I just mentioned a couple things about that. Okay. So here's the concept, faster, better, easier. And let me just start off with a little uh, quick uh, case that happened to me. I often find that I discover these things when I'm put under pressure. <laughs> Somebody gives me a challenge, and because of that challenge, I figure out a better, faster, easier way to do it. <laughs> and that's what happened with the first example that I'm going to give you. I got a call one day. Uh, from Maureen Baca. She uh, used to be very active in ISPI. She was at uh, Sandia National Labs. And she said, Daryl, I just got one of those requests you're always talking about. Uh, a fellow came in and he says, um, um, we need some training for our managers. And she said, I don't know if they need training or something else. Okay. And so, you know, here's an opportunity for you, Daryl. Come <laughs> put, your, <laughs> put your money where your mouth is, or, so to speak. Uh, come and, and do this. Now she said they're not going to stand still though. This is the upper level management. They're not going to stand still for this taking three months to do. So whatever you're going to do, you need to do it fast. And of course, got to be good. So, uh, and we're dealing with the Department of Energy. And uh, so, um, what we set up was uh, not only did I, uh, we, we, we ended up choosing uh, interviews as the main uh, data gathering source, uh, and this was because the audience is small and they're all in one place. You know, Sandia National Labs in Albuquerque. And uh, so uh, there were about 21 managers. So, you know, um, that's, that's where we went with them. Um, and uh, so I said, well, okay, so could, I, could I have um, some people help transcribe some tapes? I'd like to tape the interview. So, well, she went one better. She had a fellow that was a fabulous note taker. And so he came with me and he took notes and, and we did tape it. And then she had four or five secretaries lined up to, you know, transcribe the tapes and all this sort of thing. And then at night I would look at this and, you know, on the computer and uh, begin to categorize things. I had been there, so, you know, doing the interview, so I had some memory, of course, of what went on and everything. 
but I, and I started to notice certain patterns. So what I simply did was to copy uh, what they had said, the real thing, and put it into buckets of your files, into buckets, if you will. And then, eventually, what I did was summarize what everybody had said and make a recommendation for the kind of intervention that might help with the issues that they were discussing. But they always could look at what people really said. Now, we kept it confidential in that the people's names weren't attached to the comments. Okay. So, I, uh, so that worked pretty well, and Jane Saint at the back of the room, many of you met her, she's my wife and partner in business. And uh, Jane was one of the people helping to process all these tapes. Well, when we got done, I said, <laughs> she said, that was fun, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> but by the end of the one week, in one week, I had a preliminary report to give to the vice president. Okay, And then I went back and hammered out a really nice report, and we had that to them within two more weeks. Um, but, you know, we, we could see main patterns and, and give him suggestions about what, and so we ended the week with, with a meeting with him. So it worked really fast <laughs> for me. <laughs> it was really easy for me, not so easy for the other people. So the next time that came along, I happen to remember I used to work in a community college working with faculty to design their programs. And I remember we had a court reporting program there. And I go, well, wait a minute. So why couldn't I take the tapes and give it to court reporters and they transcribe it? Well, today we've got all kinds of wonderful other things. If you're doing it by telephone, you know, if you do it through your conference uh, system, uh, then uh, certainly uh, you can get a transcription of that, as well as the electronic copy and this sort of thing. If you do that, I suggest you, you tell them this is not a legal document, so I don't need a real fancy index of everything like they would give for a, you know, uh, uh, an interview that is uh, legal. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, it doesn't cost quite as much and so forth. And so now we, we do them uh, via telephone. Maybe we're talking to people all over the world to do a, essentially a needs assessment. And we can get it quickly. So how is it faster, easier, better? <laughs> okay, it's better because it's the real stuff. It's not my notes, not even the note takers notes that I get to look at. I get to look and see what Don really said. Hi, Don. <laughs> nice to see you. What Don really said about this particular issue, and everybody else too. Okay. So um, that's why it's better. They get their information faster. Uh, we can do a pretty heavy duty needs assessment in, in four weeks. Pretty heavy duty. Uh, lots of interviews and that sort of thing. Uh, collecting some other data and uh, sort of it really it's the time to make sure we get the interviews set up and stuff like that so if we usually take two of those weeks one week one additional week for analysis and one additional week for writing the report so that's the idea it came out of that <laughs> stretch so well it better be fast Daryl and uh, it better be good so let me just see if I can uh, summarize that for you a little bit maybe I should have started off here I want a common ground for these two words. You all have seen them, right? And also, depending on who you're talking to in the field, uh, they're called different things. I, uh, I kind of use Roger Kaufman's idea where needs assessments coming up with the needs or issues or problems, okay? And getting a list of those and deciding which ones are important to go ahead and do a root cause analysis on. You know, maybe you know, somebody said this is a need, and it is, but you know what? It's not that big of a problem, and it's not worth our time, effort, and so forth to go ahead with it. And needs analysis, the second part, identifies the root causes then of high priority needs. Now, sometimes this is, if you talk to uh, Robert Mager, he is still around, <laughs> not active in ISPI anymore, but he calls it performance analysis. So if you're using that term, I, I think he was pretty much... Uh, Give credit for starting that, uh, that term. Um, I know that Harold Stolovich and Erica Keats, when they made a, a nice, uh, wonderful document on uh, what they call front end analysis, they went through that and they said, let's just call it all front end analysis, you know. Um, so, but what we're not talking about here is a training needs assessment. And that gets thrown, that's why it gets us all tricked up. 
Uh, training needs assessment is more where we're saying, okay, we know it's going to be learning is the solution. Okay? So now, where are the learners and where do they need to be? What's that gap? That's different than there's a performance gap or there's things that are not going on that way. Okay? So I hope that helps a little bit. That terminology really gets misused uh, in the field. So I wanted to start there. But let's see how we did it faster, better, or easier. Just one quick review then of what I told you in the way of story. So you need some way to record then the interviews. The better the recording, you know, the easier it is to transcribe that and so forth. Like I mentioned, it could be uh, over uh, uh, conference phones where that's done for you by whoever your carrier is. And we need to get this transcribed. I mentioned the hard way. <laughs> and uh, Jane decided she didn't want to do that again. <laughs> so uh, we went to a transcription service. So if it's raw and you can only get a tape or something like that, then uh, and we're beginning to, uh, uh, of course, have some availability of voice recognition technologies and, and that sort of thing, too. analysis then. So record it, transcribe it, analyze it, and um, uh, this before I go on to this. So that's, that's, the, basic, uh, that's the basic idea of that, uh, of uh, faster, better, easier. See, it was better because it's accurate, right? It's faster because it doesn't take, I'm talking about the time of the instructional designer or the time of the performance analyst. Uh, it's less time for them. It's happening in some other way that they're getting that data into the computer where they can quickly search by using word searches and, and phrases. And you see, since I was there, for, for example, one of the things that they talked about in that particular case was external clients and internal clients. So I just did a word search for, you know, clients. And was it really talking about internal? Okay, went into that bucket. Externally went into that bucket. And, and so uh, pretty, pretty soon you, you start to recognize patterns and you can get them in there. And so I would read each one and say, is that really what they're talking about or is it something else? If it was, it went in. If it didn't, it didn't go in. All right. So <clears throat> then I got on to a little addition to this around needs assessment and needs analysis. You know, it is in the model, in the ISD model. It says needs assessment. In fact, uh, you've got a, a one pager front and back, and uh, the, the basic model is there in front. Implementation is not on there. This is the model we use uh, when we're teaching instructional design and development. We don't go into implementation that much because it's mostly to teach you how to do development. Um, and you see needs assessment right there at the top, right? And if you turn it over, there's, there's how we've adapted the model to e-learning. And it looks pretty familiar up there at the top again, doesn't it? We still got to do all that stuff just because it's e-learning. It doesn't mean we throw all this ISD stuff out that we, we never, you know, we don't base it on real business needs and stuff like that. Okay? So, um, uh, it's there and it's in, so, here, here's the thing though. One way to do it faster, better, easier is maybe not to do it. Anybody do regulatory training? Okay. Do you have a choice to do training or not? No. Yeah. So why would you start with a performance analysis, a needs assessment analysis? You want to know where the learner's at, you know, what is the regulation, what's that gap. So you would do more of a training needs assessment, if you will. You're trying to assess how much, where they're at when they start, you know, the entry level, and where do I need them to be. And so how do I do that cleverly and make them pay attention and drive the point home, right? So anytime the training goal is absolutely clear and you don't have any choice, it's like, why would you go out and interview 50 people about whether you should have training or not? Doesn't make any sense. So uh, I came up with, uh, we have a little needs assessment uh, workshop that's about a day and a half long. I came up with this little uh, job aid, when to use it, when not to use it. So sometimes we just need to, we do need to skip some. So um, the training goal is clear. It's regulatory in nature, that sort of thing. It's new hires. You know they don't know. And you know that they have to learn something. They're new to the job. 
and it is not a, it's not a simple job where you can just uh, let them buddy up or um, use a little quick job aid. It's a complex job and you know they don't know how to do it. Training is probably going to be needed. Um, so you may start there with a job analysis. Okay, what's the job? What, what are we hiring to? What skills do they already have when we hire? And what do we need to fill in? What are we going to train to within that job analysis? And what are we going to let happen on the job? You know, so on. Uh, new technologies. So you're bringing in a brand new technology. You know people don't know. <laughs> and you know it's complex. It's a brand new system. It's not like stuff that we have there before. Okay? If it's those kinds of situations, you don't have to ponder forever to figure out people are going to have to learn something. Okay? Now, there may be, this doesn't mean there are not other things that you want to do to help that performance out. How are you going to reinforce it back on the job? Can you provide some job aids? Can you do some of these other things? Uh, are the reward systems, even if you do a great job of learning, are the reward systems properly lined up? You know, all of those kinds of things. So, you may want to do some of that kind of analysis, but not the question about whether you're going to actually have to help people learn something. But if, yeah, there seems to be performance issues, some, something other than not knowing how to do the job involved, then we want to do that. We want to find out. We want to get to the, what are the needs and what are the root causes of the ones that are high priority. But see, one of the things you could do is, is uh, simply skip it. When the pure regulatory, that sometimes like uh, the uh, FFA, no, F. Hey, hey. <laughs> I just went to a little 4-H uh, uh, <laughs> fair with our, with our grandson. I guess I saw that stuff. FFA was showing pigs. Sometimes they have things that come out that it will be classroom training, it will be, you know, eight hours, period, and you have to do it. So you don't have to run around and asking people, do we really need training for this? <laughs> you don't have a choice. So just uh, bear that in mind that you may be in a situation like this. Okay? So, anybody got an uh, example? They're just uh, uh, dying to share with us out there now that we've kind of got the concept. Anybody got something that you've done where it made it better, it made it faster, and by the way, it was even easier. Need another example? Quick one? Guy, go ahead. Well, I use a group process to bring together the master performers and subject matter experts and anybody else that needs to be involved to kind of build a consensus model of what, what is the terminal performance, what are the enabling knowledge and skills and things like that, and, and building a consensus with uh, the clients, uh, people, it becomes something that they own and something that you don't, don't own. It's theirs. It's their words. They can see to this right. consensus of what that performance looks like. And so I think that's better because yeah. they now take ownership of it and it's their language. It's not been converted by uh, an instructional analyst. Okay. And how about the other components? Faster, easier? I'm very familiar with what you're yeah, talking it's, about. Yeah, it's, it is faster because you can sometimes get these done in maybe a two, depending on the scope of it. Right. But if you're looking at a whole job, you can usually do that in three or four days. That's right. And the developer, from the developer's point of view, if you're talking about that for the, for the faster, easier part, uh, from the developer's point of view, you don't have to run around and interview this subject expert and that subject, you know, all, and then you find out, oh God, they, they disagree and, <laughs> you know, what am I going to do now? I'll go back to all of them and, you know, so uh, it's the idea of they're all in the same room. It's a wonderful process the guy has. We've, uh, we've uh, both been the recipient of that, that when they went on and developed some training <laughs> and uh, I think we put you with our client once to... Yes help them out. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> a, a sort of a version of that that I've used is to only allow myself to talk to one person in a certain category, like one subject matter expert huh? or one senior executive, <coughs> and then put something down on paper that the other people can then react Back to. to. Okay, that speeds it up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of the draws out. Right, right. Yeah. Especially when they say, well, I don't know, well, that talks to someone so to get that clarified. Yeah. Well, maybe it's already clarified. Right. And sometimes, you know, there are things that 
they just emphasize one piece of it. They're not necessarily uh, any worse or better, <laughs> uh, but it's faster, and that's good too. Um, uh, let me give you a, a one or two other short examples. Um, so, a quick one here. Um, in the area, if you're if you're not familiar with the with the model of con, do you, do you know what context analysis means? It's where you're studying the learning environment. What what kind of things are going to need in the learning environment to to make it all work? It's also where you sort of ask yourself questions about the budget. It's a lot of logistical things, and you'll see it there in the model context analysis. And and uh, because you know we can't run off and make fabulous. Uh, e-learning and videos in them and so on and so forth if you got, you know, two thousand dollars. So, um, uh, it's important to know that before you ever start to design or develop something. Well, in context analysis, one, one of the questions that we always ask our clients also is, um, is there any other audience for this? Is there a secondary use for any part of the program we're about to put together? Now, we started using this very early in our, our company's history. Uh, we were actually working way back when voice message systems were new, if you can believe that. Uh, it was a while ago. And we worked with a company called Octel Communications. Actually, made probably the best system. Hewlett Packard eventually built part, uh, bought part of them. They, used the, they bought then everybody else up, and they became the, the real leader in voice messaging. And still today, I recognize their system if I call some company and you've got it. Um, uh, and uh, we were hired to uh, actually produce a education sales system. By that, it's just like the finance ones and so forth, uh, except it was to be completely educational, uh, teach people about this technology, how to use it, its benefits, so on and so forth. This is the very beginning of it. And at that time, it cost like uh, $50,000 for the system. That went in a company. Maybe a, maybe a company on like Hewlett Packard might need 15 of the systems. <clears throat> okay, so it's a big expense. So not an easy sell necessarily. And they wanted to pre-qualify quickly. So we we were hired to do that. Well, if you're trying to if you're making something that's educational like that, do you think there might be any secondary uses for what we were creating? Let me tell you some of the things that, that occurred. You know, what is voice messaging? How's it work? Okay. Um, what are the benefits of it? Do you think this could be used someplace else? Yeah. We got lots and lots of extra mileage for them by considering that right up front. Because what we did is we made sure that if some, some information was sensitive to one audience compared to another audience, we put it in a separate document or, you know, we had, we had a videotape, we had a couple of videotapes that were created. And uh, we were careful that those didn't have information that would be sensitive to the public or something like that and if you were doing that with sales training whenever you're doing sales training uh, what do sales people need to know about a product how it works what's its benefits right what's its advantages now on this hand I'll, I'll put the other stuff that you got to be careful about how we price it <laughs> how we stack up against the competition you know what 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 issues are we going to have to overcome against the competition Okay, we don't want to tell the whole world about that, do we? <laughs> okay, but these three things, what is it, how's it work, and what's its benefit, could be used for new employee orientation, uh, perhaps. Uh, uh, it could be used uh, with the public even, you know, a, a customer education piece. So, um, we have uh, done a lot of added value for our clients with this one. And it virtually costs us no more time if we know up front. Now, later, if you embed things that are sensitive into a videotape or something for one audience, if you're only thinking of the primary audience, it's too late by then. It's like too costly to back up. So it's really important to do it up front. Now that one, it's better for the client and <laughs> they get more mileage out of this thing. Um, it is, uh, um, I don't know that it's faster, okay? But, but what I mentioned was it didn't cost us any extra time, we don't think. And it, it uh, is, uh, in terms of ease, not so much. So we got something here that's faster and better for the client. <laughs> Doesn't really cost us anything. And, um, it, you know, we've added out. So, so that's what I mean by not always do you have all three in there. And we've not violated anything in the instructional design model. 
very important. Okay. Well, let's get you active. Try this out. I think that's enough to give you a feel for it. And uh, I know that we've got a lot of experienced people here, so I'd like for you to get into groups. How about we say that we have groups of, a, of four to five people, okay? And you can just form that. You're all adults. I noticed that. <laughs> How are you going to divide that? <laughs> four or five people. Uh, uh, and one person, you know, tell them an, an idea. Now, don't take all day to tell. Tell pretty quickly so that we can move through it. And what it, and then bounce around three or you know four or five maybe. And then I'd like you to choose one uh, that you can share. And um, I, I want to make sure that you try to pay attention to it. It's not violating ISD. Oh well, you know why? I skipped the audience analysis. What? <laughs> you got to at least know what the entry level of the audience is and some things like that. You might have found a way to do it quickly, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I want to make sure that we're we're. Um, uh, staying true to, to the ISD model. Okay? So let's go ahead and do that. So um, there's a little worksheet on your uh, handout there. Uh, your attention, please. Okay. Oh, go for it, Jane. She's got the best whistle in town. Yes. And we, we're very fortunate as ID because the design document gives us 30% of what we need. Based on the design document, we then, as IDs, develop our outline. The business unit directors, as well as program managers and technical managers, usually create that. And then we take it, and then we create our outline, which we then go into our kickoff meetings with our SNEs. It's a great tool, yeah. and it really does save us as IDs a lot of time in terms of uh, content gathering and research. Uh, the company I work for, they have tons of silos um, of information. So you can spend days researching. Uh -huh. So the design document does make things faster right. and better and easier. Fabulous. And what are some of the elements that go into a design document? Your we, um, the product, um, is that the product? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Features, function, benefits, competitors, um, challenges for selling. Okay. So I'm creating... Um, Mostly sales. Excuse me. Yes, I'm creating uh, content for systems and sales engineers. So they're all selling. And they need to know how it works. Some troubleshooting because customers will ask, you know, what happens if such as that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, what you do. Yeah, how do we respond to that? Because otherwise it's an objection, it's a question not answered exactly. in the sales process. Okay, great. And then you take it from there. And right. they've already done a lot of your research, upfront research. Okay. Exactly. We're a great believer in design documents. Now for us, it's a little more, uh, in, um, the instructional designers and in, a little more involved in that. Um, uh, and it often has our objectives for the program. This and is rare. Um, I'm, I'm used to working like you, where we, yeah. we have more input. But getting the content people to put that together. It's rare for me. This is a first uh -huh. position. And it's working well. Received it. That would speed the process for sure. And since it came from them, hopefully it's more accurate. It is. It is. It has it been through somebody interpreting it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very, very good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Somebody else? I guess I got the last it. Getting to a, a prototype as quickly as you can. Oh, Whatever solution yeah. that you're trying to, to build. Um, the example I gave was when I was working for Sprint, I was building performance support solutions for applications used across the company. And there was just kind of a template that, that had been developed, kind of a look and feel for it. What are these pop-up windows with all this uh -huh. content? You know, going to look like uh, going going to a new group who needed this. Getting to that prototype session where you could present something to that group of stakeholders or SMEs or, or whoever was involved right. with, with trying to design. Getting them uh, engaged as quickly as possible um, really sped up the, the, the 
uh, analysis piece, even though there was some upfront analysis, you know. Um, right. So the, the whole idea is just getting to a prototype, presenting a prototype to the stakeholders as soon as possible in right. the process. It's right. going to speed up, speed up things. Right. And that absolutely uh, fits the ISD principles. Mm -hmm. Prototyping, there's lots of literature on that about getting something up quickly. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we're finding that to be particularly helpful in e-learning. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if people don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, to create, uh, we call it the skinny version sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> a skinny version of the program. It's a little bit of, uh, of uh, you know, smoke and mirrors. But you can see what's going to happen and basically what the program's going to look like. And so that's even up front for the little look and feel. And how is this going to be? Is it going to be menu driven? Can the person move all around in it? Or is it, uh, do they have to go about it in a structured way? Because it's uh, learning that's the one thing's dependent upon another. So they have to take that part first and then something else second. Uh, so a great idea, uh, uh, a terrific uh, thing to do, get up prototypes as quickly as you can. I've created sample modules real quick, just one module for something that's going to be big. And, um, uh, and it just, you know, right away brings it to life for the client. And uh, they can either, and it also keeps you from going down the wrong path. Exactly. Yeah, ooh, wow, I didn't know that I'm off target here, you know. And let's get that straightened out before we invest in too much time and energy. And you use the right word. We also call that kind of a sign of life. And it, it lets people know that there is work being done. And they see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, and it's a really good point. That's why I like also the design document idea. Uh, we put a design document together. And it's a formal document when we're doing a project for a client. And we teach that also in our workshops. Uh, we really encourage people to... Uh, uh, create a design document because of that very thing. Uh, Two it, is, is it shows progress. progress. We, we deal in something where the client, your internal client, or I'm working, for, you can sit there and say, well, I don't know, it's been four or five weeks, hope Daryl's doing something. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen anything. They start getting really nervous, you know. And there is the whole psychology, if you will, of working with people and, and uh, working with your internal clients, or extra, if you're external, with, with your own clients. It's very important to not let that go on too long. And it has the added value that you might be wrong, too. You might be <laughs> off. And so showing them something quickly is really, really important. Yeah. And building on that, our group was talking about, Mary was using an example where she was part of a team designing um, a training for a new cross-enterprise application. and what they did is they worked and jumped in any time with the uh, the primary stakeholder group mm -hmm. to develop uh, a prototype that they did in a Visio flowchart. Mm -hmm. And then they used the Visio flowchart to work with the SMEs and the other uh, groups that would be less frequent users or, or less power users. Go. Save you time, which makes it easier, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, and it fits the ISD uh, process, you know. And it reminded me of one other thing that I've done as well, because people, as we all know, learn differently. And I've done a lot of visual recording um, with groups in, in doing that kind of research and bringing that out. And visual recording is another way to um, access information and share information with people who are more visual learners. So when you say visual recording, are you saying you are, uh, you know, putting post-its up on the wall? No, 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 no. You're actually, you're, 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 you're mapping it. You're, you're mapping concepts as people, uh, as groups, when you... Um, so you're drawing a picture together. You're, you're literally drawing a picture, and sometimes you can have um, pictures across a whole set of walls that uh, map the process. So you have you have a, a written map of what's going on, and record it. you also have a visual map, which allows people to retain information, some people differently, but better. Nice. I'll just add the swim lanes piece to the flowchart. Mm -hmm. So we created swim lanes and we were able to identify what was common across the board. And that's where we needed to hone in us. Very, very good ideas. Yes, sir. To uh, further piggyback off your idea, <laughs> they had, uh, good. the idea that we had or that we talked about was a learner tryout, which is um, mm -hmm. essentially taking that prototype which he mentioned and Putting it in front of the stakeholders, obviously, but also getting a sample population of the uh, of, of 
the learning group, putting it in front of, in front of sample learners. Uh, doesn't make it faster on the front end, but once you get past that, that event and you have that actual learner data, it makes it better, faster, easier the rest right. of the way through development because you've got yeah. so many of your questions answered. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, very good tool to have when you go against uh, certain SME opinions. Yeah. To, to have that well, right, data. right. And what's the ISD process tell us? It's whether the learner learns. <laughs> it's not, you know, uh, so we, we, you know, testing things out on the learner, I'm going to have a little more of an example later about that particular area. But it is one of the things that I think separates instructional design and development, good instructional design and development, just from somebody who has an intuition for it. It's the actual saying, we're going to collect data from the learners, we're going to find out what worked, what didn't. And to do that, you need all those other parts too. What was the objective that the lesson was supposed to accomplish? And how did we measure that to see if they actually were able to do it? Oh yeah, we want to know if they liked it too. We do go there, okay? Uh, because if it's not appealing and so forth, then, you know, it may fail for that reason. And one other important thing, it breeds uh, ownership and it breeds buy-in. Because if you are part of that prototyping team, uh, all of a sudden, your idea is up there. Right. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, of course, common, common vision. That's a great training. <laughs> you want to fly this. How about over here? Some group. Did you guys come up with something? We did. I think uh, we are in more of a retail environment. So what we find is that by having our corporate office in one location and I think over 1,700 stores now um, throughout the country, it's easier for us from the corporate perspective to think that this is what we want to accomplish, but then we have to map that to the real world perspective of our associates. So sometimes depending on the job role, it's faster to go into the store and to try to perform that job and then map that, not, ag not only mm. against the business requirement, mm. but against the current processes that are in place. And you start to ask the associates, well, if I'm doing this, how do I accomplish that? And you start to get real world responses and feedback from them, as opposed to, well, this is what I think she wants to hear. Which, again, on the front end, it takes a, a considerable amount of time, but you get the, the buy-in or the street credit and when you go back to the office, it's easier to reach back out to the field and contact them, again, to ask additional questions. And they will open up to you a lot. So you're more. actually going there and learning some of the job yourself. Right. And um, it, it helps with the business partner as well when they realize that you've taken that time to invest in it right. and that you're just as committed to their process and to, to the success of their process. Yeah, yeah, I like that part about the buy-in and, and uh, with, along with it. And there, there are some times, you know, sometimes we make too big a deal, and that, that's part, part of the reason ISD is getting sort of a bad name here and there, is we've overdone it in some places. Um, I do remember in graduate school, walking in, I was so impressed, I was just starting, and I walked into this uh, grad student's office, and plastered on the wall were these task analysis that went on forever. I didn't know that's what it was called then, but I soon learned that that was called a task analysis. I just, oh my goodness, it was overwhelming. And later, I got to see the final product. And it was a piece of junk. <laughs> just a little lesson that I learned long, 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 long time ago. <laughs> that you know, talk about analysis paralysis. So don't overdo it uh, in some of some of these areas. And sometimes, if a job is so simple or a product is so simple, and you're having trouble, I don't. You know, one of the things about dealing with subject experts, and you can't really get a content expert. It's simpler to learn it yourself. <laughs> I'll see a developer just spinning wheels and spinning wheels. Well, you know, it doesn't seem like that hard, and there's the document tape. Why don't you just learn it yourself and create a nice training program, test it out, and right away, see if it actually works with the learner. And uh, we'll forget about all this hassle of trying to get somebody in here. And I won't work with, you know, highly technical things or something where you're trying to capture the culture of the company and all that sort of stuff. But, okay, how about you folks back there in the corner? Did you come up with anything? Um, Yes. <laughs> and if you didn't, you will now. <laughs> uh, so just a 
kind of other this later. There's a couple different ways that you can help facilitate some of the review cycles that you might end up having. Um, nice. Gave an idea about using some of the online um, document repositories that you can have through collaboration. Uh, I'm not, not talking exclusively about going to meeting, although I'll give an example of that just moment, but I'm thinking of Office Live. Um, a couple of document repositories, so if you have a job that you're working on and you're having a hard time getting it passed around, and you know the problems of passing it around, you know, you can try changes in one place it takes it, marks it up, because it's another. Well, in this space, you can have it all right there. Everyone can mark it up in real time, and everyone can see what everyone else has done. And then that way, when I work with project liaisons, when they end up touching it at the end, they don't have to bring in all these comments and, and really not really have to do with it. So that, I guess there's one example there. The other, the other you know, uh, subject matter experts, they're so easy to, to, uh, to kind of bring in and uh, get them to you know, provide the feedback and, and to develop material. <laughs> well, I actually got this idea from a subject matter expert who was having the same problem with sub subject matter experts. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a blast. Oh, that's a good. So anyway, we were on uh, we were on a power uh, a go to meeting, and he had a PowerPoint with the main topics on it, and forced everyone to participate. And which you know, it's hard to do a go to meeting, so I kind of have a strategy for that. You could just like. You know, to catch people who are just maybe napping at the cubicle or whatever, or on the computer, you could just give them the presenter mode real quick and make them the presenter. And then when they're kind of like, you know, they don't know when that's going to happen, so you just kind of like, you know, surprise them and kind of trick them into participating. <laughs> but I mean, that's a, anyway, that's a, that's an effective way of getting people to at least keep in contact. Not going to be around too much. Very good. Very good. Working with content experts, big challenge. Don't know why. That's a, it's, a, it's a topic I've tried to tackle before, um, but uh, uh, we keep we do keep running into once in a while. A lot of it's cultural. You, are you dealing? We're dealing with one uh, company right now that the culture is you don't do stuff on time. <laughs> Just trying, I mean, nobody shows up on time. Nobody gets anything to you when they said they would get it to you. Cool. Where do I sign up? <laughs> It's really, uh, it's it's really, uh, really challenging, yeah. And uh, so uh, it's interesting because they just got bought by another company, and it's a large, very, very large pharmaceutical, over a hundred thousand employees. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that attitude. <laughs> uh, okay, who else? One more. Yes. Um, we had actually discussed about analyzing and seeing what tools are already available that we could reuse and modify for whatever training we're doing. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I could, and if not only tools for it, tools for doing development, you mean? Well, actually, the, the example that I gave them was when I was looking for a pharmaceutical company, they had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop animation for their uh, commercials, for their mm -hmm. advertisements. Mm -hmm. And I said, I want it. I wanted. I wanted a simpler form. You had to. You had to start out with the digital form. Give me the digital form, and that's what I used as the basis to do all the training around. And that way, the salespeople used it, the doctors used it, and then when they saw it, it was reinforced. Yeah, yeah. I like so that. You got the same thing. Uh, you, you were, you were uh, taking something that already exists and getting a secondary use. Which side of what you said? That's right. That's right. Can I piggyback that one? Here's another one that's a favorite of mine. Um, uh, and uh, how many people have been a school teacher? Oh, wonderful. Then you, you already know about this. Let me just bring it out. Then. Okay, you know how you, 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 you know, you can't make all your materials as a teacher usually. It's just too much, you know, there's, maybe you're teaching five different courses or something, subjects or whatever. And so you learn very early on to use existing resources, whether it's a book, whether it's a film, whether it's a, you know, whatever it is, right, don't you? So, sometimes we maybe overstep that now about copyright, but <laughs> my daughter's a school teacher, so I find her every once in a while in my office. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, so we have a little copyright lesson, but <laughs> she quickly ignores, you know. Uh, but, but anyway, um, so uh, we call it a resource module. What we do is put the rigor into coming up with the objectives 
and the testing. Write a nice introduction, get the learners ready to learn, you know. You, you know the eight-step lesson design or nine-step lesson design, it's pretty standard. Introduce the lesson, right? Um, tell them the objectives to give them direction. Present the lesson. This is the input part. Now there's where you can use, you can often find existing materials. Is the input part, okay? Let them try it, that's practice and feedback, okay? And in that case, say you've got a wonderful video or something like that, but there's no practice. You add the practice exercises. There's no testing, you add the test. Teachers know this, I mean, that's the way they work, right? And you build a lesson of resource modules. This only works if the content, a lot of it already exists, okay? But if you get to thinking a little bit that way, what really exists that I possibly could use? Today, our access to content is pretty good, you know. Um, just how to make sure it's accurate and all that sort of thing. But can you look at documentation of something? Is there something in that documentation that can be used and double check that it's accurate and so forth? But, you know, lots of, like you found some films that could be used in a certain form. That makes excellent pre work. Things that already existed. Yes, yeah, time, yeah. That shortens your, your contact time. Yeah, yeah. So you could make a resource module. It's got some readings, but it's got objectives and it's got some activities they're supposed to do, and it's perhaps got to be an attempt for the prerequisites that you're trying to make sure everybody has. Okay? Anybody else got one that, yeah? Or, so kind of, I, the thing that we did, that I try to do in my work, is to try and find a 70% solution. Everybody thinks that they're unique. They're not. Yeah. There's something out there that's about 70% of what you do. And my motto is a 70% solution is a 700% head start. Yeah. So you just convert that's a good phrase. <laughs> that's right. So looking for things that, that already exist. Right? Okay. All right. Are you wearing out yet? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's look at one other area. You notice on the model there's the tryout and revision part called developmental testing. It means while it's being developed, and there's been some mention of things like this, creating prototypes and testing them on the learner, right? Uh, we just heard, heard about that. So developmental testing is part of the instructional design and development process. Um, I don't know if uh, how many of you kind of know the history of ISD, but Basically, it, it, it was born in World War II, and it was born in the military, and they needed some way to, some standard way, to develop training that they knew would work. It would teach lots of people to do something, whatever it was, okay? And, and they could assure that it was going to work. So trying it out and revising it was part of the process. Actually, if you're interested in a little bit of that, uh, send me an email. I, it, it's good. It's good material for putting you sleep at night. You know, <laughs> I wrote a chapter in ASTD, that other organization's handbook of workplace performance, and um, they asked me to write on models of ISD and uh, uh, how theory and all that fit in. And so I give a brief, brief history. It's not that not bad. <laughs> and I'll, I'll send you the PDF for it if you'd like. Just ask for the uh, theories and models uh, chapter. Uh, uh, so developmental testing is in that evaluation stage. Now, we kind of do it all the way along, or we should be doing it all the way along through the process as quickly as possible, maybe with a prototype. Uh, so it's a process of trying out your instructional prototypes on representing members of the target audience. So this is not, like somebody pointed out, not with the subject expert, this is a full learner. Okay? So we, maybe the subject experts have verified that the content's accurate, but now we don't know if it works with the learners. Let's, let's try it out. And here's the tryout revision cycle. And um, we call it test revision. Test means tryout. Trying out, you're testing the materials reason we word, use the word test. So you try out something, you revise it, and then the cycle goes. We had to try out our revisions, don't we? Okay, programmers understand this. If they fix they fix a problem in a program, they gotta retest everything and make sure that didn't cause some other problem. 
And just because you fixed it doesn't mean you came up with the right solution. I've done that. You know? I had a little self-instructional booklet one time and, that I put together, and I wanted this example in it. And uh, so <laughs> I, I had to look at it right away. Now, unfortunately, the example was too close to what I was teaching them to do. So I changed that, tried it again, mm -hmm. still didn't work. They kept getting confused. Am I taking the module or am I looking at the example? So finally, I put it at the back with <laughs> different colored paper, and it worked. But, you know, sometimes you think you fixed something, and it still didn't work. Maybe you made it even worse. Okay, so you got you got to retest your revisions. And so it always ends in a trial. At this point, you're hoping that it's enough right <laughs> that it's going to work with, you know, 90, 95% of the students and all that sort of thing. And so you say, it's not worth it. The curve starts leveling off the revisions. It starts out the first few revisions, try out revisions. Um, you get dramatic improvements in the performance of learners on your, on your instructional product, but then it starts to level off. Oh yeah, guys, we still have a, you know, a typo on page 55 or something like that. But is it worth retesting the whole, the whole thing was to fix the typo and the next time we, we do um, a run now. So um, uh, that's the cycle. So I wanted just to introduce, make sure we're on the same wavelength about that, to tell you about something faster, better, and easier. Um, here's what this could look like if you think you have to get 20 learners together to try something out in just making two sets of revisions. How many people do I use up? 60 people. Okay? Um, when you think about that, and I started thinking, why don't people try out revise their materials like they're supposed to? And then if you see something like this and you start to understand why they don't. They go, well, Daryl, there's only 100 people in the audience anyway. Darn it. You used up 60 of them, just getting it right. You know? Okay? Well, I faced this kind of situation a long time ago in a very large project I did for vocational schools in Saudi Arabia. We produced uh, 100 self instructional booklets in automotive mechanics and 100 in diesel mechanics and specified all the equipment tools and so forth that would go in all the, uh, uh, the uh, automotive centers within the vocational schools. And we did the project actually in San Jose. And so I was able to hire a whole staff just for this project before I started the company. I got a leave from my college and, and uh, was asked to do this through San Jose State University. Well, what was going on is our uh, labor department was there with American companies building schools and that sort of thing. They said they wanted help with curriculum. Big project. Um, about, it was a 24 month project. We got it done in 23. Um, always been a hallmark of ours. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, so, but in following the process, here's 200 then self instructional booklets. They had to be made first in English, tried out, revised, and translated to Arabic, sent to Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where they would try them out there with their. So how am I going to get this done? You know, not with that model, right? So I called up uh, Harold Stolovich. Many of you probably know Harold Stolovich. and been around ISPI for a long time, past president, writer of the first-hand, no, yeah, first-hand, first second-hand book of uh, human performance technology. Um, and uh, uh, um, Harold, uh, I, I, he's a, he was a professor at Mont University of Montreal. I called him up. I said, help, Harold. <laughs> Here's the situation I've got. And he said, well, um, and I knew he'd been doing some work with developmental testing and validation of materials on learners and that sort of thing. And he said, you need to use single subject tryouts. Okay, so, well, tell me, how could that be better than a group of tryouts? Well, he said, we wondered about that, so we did some experiments. And Susan Markle at the University of Florida, Florida State University, I should say, um, uh, did the same thing. They decided, let's do the extreme. Let's have 20 people taking a version of a program in one room. And over here, one person taking the same program, instructional program. And we'll test them on the objectives. 
We'll have fill out a questionnaire. We'll collect any materials they've got to look at how they might have marked something, did they get it wrong, or that sort of thing. Okay, and we'll verbally debrief with them afterwards. Okay, here's a fabulous one. <laughs> Guess what they found out? No significant difference in the quality of the information gotten back from 20 people for the purpose of revision or one person. Well, to a practitioner, which is what I am, a practitioner, this is dynamite stuff, backed by experimental evidence that this can occur. Now, over the years, we've refined this in certain ways. I found that I actually really like to have at least three or four, and the reason is, what if one of them's sick? <laughs> it's just little practical things you learn after a while. And, you know, so, but I do not want, I have, there's lots, there's tons of reasons not to have 20 people there. The, the, the nature of the tryout completely changes. It's like showtime. Okay. In the, in the gaming industry, kids will, you know, fight to become a tester mm -hmm. of the new game, mm -hmm. and then it's a, it's an elite position, and not everybody's got the right stuff to be a tester. But once you do it, you earn the T-shirts and, <laughs> and the games and the free release and bragging rights with your friends that you're on the That's right. on this thing. But then the, the industry treats those kids like gold because they are telling them, it's cool, but it doesn't work. It's not that this cool. Way. Yeah. If you use it this way, it'd be much cooler. Right. So they get great information uh, you know, from just one person trying this thing out. So maybe you use three or four, but we one of the reasons we don't want 20 there is because it's showtime. And by that, I mean it's mark what happens to the marketing of your program. You know, you put the program together. And you call it a pilot. I'd rather call it opening night. Because that's what it is. It's showtime. Think of a play. Would you, would you put on a play and not do a dress rehearsal? That's what you're doing when you put on training programs that have not been tested. Okay? When also, psychologically, I can't, I'm a psychologist, but I can't, tell, I can't tell, name it or what, but what happens is that you get 20 people together, their expectations, no matter what you tell them, are that this is ready to go. And if it's not good, and maybe it didn't take hardly anything to fix it. You told people to pass up with three rows back and four people over, and that confused everybody. All you had to do was change the direction and say, exchange it to the person next to you. <laughs> you know, it, but it was chaos for 20 people. So that's, that's another, because then they run back, and what did they say? They told people they told Yeah, lousy training. I wouldn't even go. <laughs> if you've got one or two people or three people and you explain to them this is a trial of materials, this is not to test you, we're going to be using this with large groups of people, you know, over time, whether it's e-learning or e-learning even more, because there you're mostly dealing usually with self-instructional things. And you even need more testing. There's no, no instructor present to, to uh, help fix something. Um, so uh, uh, developmental testing is even more important. Uh, so, um, uh, what I want to do is I want to get the tryouts, and when I say this, in my own company, sometimes we'll have a client that says, no, no, I want 20 there, and I'll work with the developer, and I'll say, when, when, when is it that you're going to have this? Well, next Thursday, it's now Wednesday, the previous week, and I said, guess what, Friday, you put it on for me. You tell me what I know and what I don't know, and you're going to put it on for me. We are not going to go in front of 20 people not having rehearsed this, practiced this, tested this, and to make that sure you actually. It's amazing if it's instructor-led that the, the developer will go through it and they'll be going like, that's a little too many slides, isn't it? <laughs> that's a little, you know, I don't think that direct, I'm not even saying anything to them. The fact that they went through it, okay? So just a little, you know, I kind of get on the fan, like the, the box, right? Yeah. A very tiny fast way easy better. When you do that, the first time you present material to anybody, get somebody in the room who is has, has that good eye, that good editor eye, who's going to find every typo and every comma, and let them sit in the back of the room and get your typos and commas out of the way. Very you good. So you're, done, you're, you're lessening your effort. To, you're, you're doing it all at once. Yeah. They should not, in, I will uh, hasten to add though, and I'm sure you don't, but they should not in any way interfere with what's going on with the learning. sitting there making that yeah. 
Very good. All right, so that's one. Um, and I had to, to help drive that home a little bit. I, my artist, is, she knew I liked frogs. <laughs> and so the idea is, do you need 10 frogs when one frog will do? <laughs> the thing of it is, what you get is a, relatively the same information back. So there was, uh, there was some problem with the drawing on page 54. <clears throat> How many times have you told that? Once or twice? <laughs> right? So lots of the things are like that. That's, it's kind of counterintuitive. So it's a hard, it's, it's kind of hard to uh, think that that would go better than trying it out with 20 people. Now, if you want to say, I'm going to try it out 20 times each time with a different person, and you know for the tryouts, it always has to be different. It's not the same person. You can't use the same people in the first tryout and the second tryout. New learners. Not so you're using that, you are using up that audience. Uh, um, and uh, uh, so I thought we all should have a frog just to help us remove the idea of things. So, <laughs> so I'm going to give this time to pass around here. <laughs> so we see the frog paint the single stone fantastic. <laughs> Days? Probably not. Probably not. Here's some of our suggestions just to be practical. If it's two days or less, we do say try it out with just three or four people. You know, that's not that much time to go through. I make arrangements to test any large group activities. Let's say you've just got two or three people, but you actually have something that does require six people to do it. Well, you can just test that activity. You don't have to get all those people together to be there all the time. Uh, conduct a walkthrough if it's more than two days um, of the course. Uh, have some learners present um, and maybe other developers even watching for things that are wrong with it. Test all high risk activities. What do I mean by that? Um, if you're if it's instructor led training, you're doing a role play, things of that nature, case studies where people may get confused and you've not tried that out before, um, you want to make sure you test those activities out uh, completely. Develop and test a few modules, then feed forward the information. Here's another, the people were talking about testing a prototype. This is something that really saves the developers uh, time and uh, gets things right the first time, pretty much. If you get that prototype together, the first few modules we test really thoroughly. And incidentally, to save time, it doesn't have to be the same developer that's writing the materials that tests it out. Okay? Keep that in mind. See, that's a tremendous saver. The person writing, we don't get in their way for nothing. <laughs> that's the critical path. The person that's actually creating the materials. And so if there's anything at all we can do to take a burden off of them, we do it. Quite literally. We have quiet time in the office. Uh, that large Saudi Arabian project I told you about, there were 11 people. We had a, I made sure we had a, a building and a room away from the university that we office in. 
I went through some pain over that with the university people, but they wanted it on campus. But I knew exactly what had happened. Everybody would come there and hang out. We had a lot of writing to do, okay? Even within our own office, quiet time all morning long. That means I don't interrupt them, nobody else interrupts. You know, save your questions. You know, e you know, don't be e in this world today. <clears throat> shut down the email somehow. You know, don't be uh, letting it beep at you and being interrupted. Writing is a concentrated effort. It's very, very important. Sooner or later, for your instructional designer, you have to write the material. Okay. Oftentimes, when I'm writing things for um, instructors, a um, facilitator actually um, present the material in the test. That way, I can watch the learners and the facilitator see where those um, the hangups are, what, what becomes difficult. Excellent. Um, and then some improvement. Let somebody else <coughs> mm -hmm. Because I'm not going to be presenting it. Exactly. So you're testing your instructor notes and everything like that, Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. Well, when you're talking about more than two days, um, say you have a, a three to four day um, training, yeah. how, how long does it take to conduct a run through for something like that? Yeah, a very good question. We, we found that um, you can probably run through three days in one and a half, about 50%, maybe even less. It just depends on the kind of content you've got. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, another little uh, uh, job aid to help with that. Okay, so how about this part about modifying um, the instructional development uh, model? Um, you see on one side of your paper there, sort of the conventional, this, if you look at any of the models, they're more or less like this. There's the analysis area, design and development. They may separate those two things. I've never figured out how that, how you would, why you would do that. Sorry, so you. when you're designing, you're also creating. And, and so, you know, I sometimes hear of groups that, well, we designed it, somebody else developed it. I'm like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it seems to me like it's uh, if you risk disconnect, and uh, secondly, um, uh, you're, you're going to have to bring that person up to speed on the project if they're developing it and somebody else designed it. How do you split that development out? I'm really good at writing the content. I suck at Flash. Oh, well, that's so a different story. That's a different story. Yeah, that's no, I mean, cr flash. actually creating the, the learning <laughs> aspect of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no. Actually, I, I encourage that the instructional designer doesn't get so carried away with all that stuff. Because that's going to waste their time. You know, there are developers today, uh, that, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you've been here, you know, when all this stuff was just starting to happen, you've been hearing me make a real pitch for, you know, them staying away from all of it. And we'll have, you know, technical people do that. But today, there, I have designers and developers that um, can do that so quickly that it makes sense to, to have it. Okay. But now, on the other side, let's go with e-learning. And I started working with this model when, first, when we first started getting projects. And uh, to tell you the truth, over the years, what I found is any time any new delivery system comes out, um, you know, uh, I mean, there was a point, anybody remember touchscreen interactive video training? <laughs> You know, IBM did it. Actually, we did some programs for it. Um, exciting stuff. <laughs> but anyway, so it kind of took a whole different approach, right? But you didn't lose the fundamentals. You didn't lose the fundamentals. What you're going to see here is we think that, and I got other people's advice on this too, so that first part that you see on the, the e-learning side, uh, you see the needs analysis, making sure it trains the answer, okay? And um, if it's not, you use other interventions. Um, audience content and context, okay? Uh, e-learning appropriate, okay? If it is, then what do you do? You, you're going to develop the e-learning. And then we, what we find is there's sort of three paths here. There's a regular instructional design path. And whether the, the instructional designer, to tell you the truth, knew a lot technically, it wouldn't matter as long as they understand the idiosyncratic things about that delivery system. They can create it, they can write it, they can create the, inter the interactions and so forth. But there is, you know, creating e-learning is, you know, you're making a program. 
So there's a programming path we feel. Now some, like I said today, some of these are woven together by certain very qualified people. They're rare. <laughs> and then project management is much heavier in an e-learning project. There's just a lot more, especially if it has any size to it. Um, at, at more than, than say, the structural learning program. Oftentimes, it, I think people actually, you want to save some time and money, I think people get too carried away with uh, that, that there's supposed to be this uh, project manager that's separate from the instructional designer. Yeah, I, I have a lead instruction. Actually, if I got a, a great big project, there's a lead instructional designer and developer who will create some of the prototypes and so forth, those first modules, patterns, then we bring in the develop, uh, more developers, brief them and so forth, so we can divide up the pie and get lots of stuff done. That person stays as the project manager. There's several other advantages. What if one of those designers gets sick, can't perform anymore, or we discover for some reason it can't perform, it's only happened a couple times. Um, then that lead designer can step in and take over that development effort. Maybe I come and help project manage or something. So, uh, I, I don't think it's a bad idea at all to, uh, especially if the project is small, I don't know why you're having a separate person do the project management. If it's larger, there's a point where uh, we, we have something in our, in our company we call the project coordinator. This is a person that sets up appointments, gets, you know, logistical things done, because I want to take that off of the professional but I still want that professional being the one responsible for the project. And it's worked for me for 30 years. <laughs> yeah? So I question for you. Uh, are your project managers, the people that serve as project managers and the design, yes. do they have more of an ID background and they pick up project management, or are they project managers and they pick up the ID? Yeah, they've been, they've been ID from the get-go pretty much, and then, then they pick up the project management. Just a little other perspective on that. If you're working inside a big company yeah. that is truly a project management oriented company, I would disagree with your approach because the person who has an ID mind does not have the same kind of mind they want a project manager. You won't get that same mix of skills and attitude and approach. And if you're going to have to be constrained to the corporate way of doing project management. That's going to really straight. Well, you just give yeah, you get a particular context. So I, I agree if that's a requirement of the culture and the context, you're going, to, you're going to need to do that. One of my objections to having a separate person that is schooled in project management, run instructional design programs, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you know what, guy? You promised me objective number two today. Where's it at? <laughs> now, guy because he's an experienced developer, found out he couldn't get access to the subject matter expert to get objective two. But he got five, six, seven, and eight done with another one. And I find that it about drives the developers crazy to be micromanaged like that. And project managers that are trained to be project managers, I'm sure some you know, it's project managers that are trained to be project managers and don't understand the ins and outs of instructional design and development that it's a fairly fluid thing uh, and dependent on a lot of other people like subject experts and, that, and when you get the content. Uh, oftentimes, now maybe we can coach them all about that, <laughs> but, but that's the reason I also don't like them in charge. I never put anybody in charge of the project except the instructional design. Call me crazy. <laughs> okay. So some, some little differences, but not that much. If you look at that main uh, middle uh, strand, you find there that uh, uh, it's, it's the basic model, not violating any fundamentals. Still got to have objectives. Still got to have activities. Still got to have practice. You know, all those things. Still got to testing. OK. So um, let, me, uh, let me go to this one uh, as a way to, uh, to wrap up. Uh, just some tips that I've been weaving in a few of them here uh, along the way so that I have found about project management. 
uh, team selection, really, really critical. These are things that I think really make winning instructional design at all the teams. And probably a number of you know, if I do a great job of selecting the right team, my work is almost done with a project. It really is. Just monitoring some to make sure they've got the resources, know that they can turn to me if they need more resource, things like that. I don't have to do much else. You don't have the right team, you got dead eggs at all. Things. I mean, qualified people. They're, they're capable, they're reliable, okay? You can, people can work with them. But if I have to choose capable or can people just love working with them, I'll take the capability first. <laughs> uh, Jumpstart projects or kickoff meetings, where you get everybody together. If you can't get them together physically, you get them together um, virtually, okay? Three more, short time to completion. I just love when a client wants me to have something done pretty quickly. I dislike when they don't. The reason is, if we will get lots of scope creep and uh, people aren't working in such a way of, let's get it. And I find we get a better product when, when everybody's thinking short time to completion. Stay with it, keep the momentum going. Provide uninterrupted time for developers. I mentioned that one. Quiet time even in an office or they can work at home. Um, avoid setting unnecessary controls and procedures. And this is one that has been overdone. There's no question about it in ISD where you see that you know, these manuals that are this thick and you better fill in every worksheet in there. Organize for speed and results versus process and control. <coughs> Use technology to aid communications and productivity. One group had that idea. Very good. Track project personnel's time for estimating future projects. <coughs> Have you all done that? Some of you? It's really helpful. It's really, really helpful. And people will vary. I mean, we are people. You know, some are faster at certain kinds of things than others. So tracking that time, so I, I, I never do it, even people I've done projects with them for a long, long time, uh, I have them track their time. It's so that I can just stay after it. With, I have to bid the project after all, right? But internally, you have to decide how much resource, you know, needs to be there and all that sort of thing. So the same thing's true. Um, use experienced lead developers for project managers. I might have overdone that one. Uh, provide, <laughs> provide my apologies to the uh, project management, uh, certified project management people out there. Provide extra production assistance and coordination towards the end of the project. There's kind of a thing that happens, you know, a funnel effect. All this stuff comes in, there's lots of production. Um, and uh, so having people just anticipating that and having some people lined up to help them out, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's getting reproduction done in uh, materials or it's. Uh, uh, you know, it's testing something out, whatever it is, just make sure that that's there. And I even advise my developers, look, here's what's going to happen. The subject matter experts, the last time they show them a draft, supposed to be to find them. They're going to find something wrong. We have a good sign. They're going to find something wrong. Build it into your project. Build one extra day just knowing it's going to happen, and then you smile, and you do it, and they think you're wonderful, and you've left them with a great impression. Okay? Instead of being cranky at the end, <laughs> what you talk about, you know. Okay? So, there's all that human nature that goes into this process, too. Yes. A little tweak on that is something that I've developed called a conditional sign-off that says, Subject matter expert is signing off conditional upon following changes. Oh, sure. Then you don't have to go back again. Right. You've already right. got it. Get that typo on page 54 and so forth. Right. That's right. What a delight to work with you this evening. I, I appreciate you being here. I hope that you've got some tips to take back home and put to work. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your tips.